Okay, so moving ahead to modern times, uh, coming out of World War II, Claude Shannon, who's famous as the father of information theory. Okay, so he invented that field, which is you know sort of the theoretical underpinnings for much of what you do in computer science and other fields as well. Uh, he also had uh, a, really a seminal paper in uh, cryptography, which we'll mention in just a minute here. But even after World War II, cryptography was really the domain of governments and military, okay? You, nobody in the outside world really did cryptography. And why was that? They just weren't smart enough? And the problem was, yeah. I think prior to computers, it was really expensive and time consuming. Well, I mean, most of the ciphers that were used even through World War II, I mean, all of them didn't use computers, okay, because there weren't really computers at the time, right? A lot of them were hand systems. In fact, code books were the most popular cipher even through World War II. Okay, the Enigma machine was used a lot, but still code book ciphers were, were very much in use. The real issue is that there was not a clear need, okay? until you started getting a lot of information computerized and sort of gathered in one place. Now people started to worry, okay? There's a big database there that has all these medical records and if that gets out, you know, we're in, you know, we've exposed a lot of people's personal and private information, so maybe we should try to protect them. <coughs> Whereas before, where were your medical records before there were computers? It was in a filing cabinet in some doctor's office somewhere, right? And if somebody broke in, they might get 10 or 20 records. <laughs> now, if somebody breaks into the computer, they're going to get thousands, perhaps millions, tens of thousands, millions of records just by breaking in. So now, okay, people started thinking, we need to protect this uh, information. The problem was nobody had any expertise. <laughs> All the expertise, oh, that's government and military, and they're not talking. So people were selling really crappy cipher systems, real snake oil kind of systems, and people couldn't tell whether these are good or bad, okay? So into that mix, of course, the government rides to the rescue, right, and creates this uh, uh, cipher system called the Data Encryption Standard, uh, which, we, which is one of those kind of watershed events in the history of cryptography, okay? This is when cryptography really moved from, you know, the the military and government control out into the private sector. It wasn't intended to be that way, but that's the way it turned out. So we'll spend some time talking about that. Okay, moving on from there, things move pretty rapidly, actually. So this is where it sort of first breaks out into the uh, you know, academic and industrial community. Uh, and then the 70s, you have public key cryptography being developed. Uh, in the 80s, you have crypto conferences, which are you know, some of the best cryptography that's being done happens there, uh, and so on and so forth. The point being that at some point, you know, really in the 70s, cryptography moved out of you know, government control. And it's out there, genie's out of the bottle, nobody's ever going to put it back now. Okay, so back to Claude Shannon, this guy who uh, founded the field of information theory. That's his uh, best known contribution. But he also had this uh, really important paper in 1949 called Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems. Okay, so he's talking about crypto systems, secrecy systems. Um, this paper, you can still go and read it. I mean, it's very well written. Everything he says is correct. He got it right. Okay. Um, and a couple of fundamental concepts that he brings up here. He's talking about how do you design um, a cipher. And it's a symmetric cipher. Nobody knew about public key systems. So for symmetric ciphers, how can you build such a system? Okay, what do you do? Well, he said you can use a couple of fundamental principles, a couple of tools that you need. Okay? And he described these as confusion and diffusion. So confusion, uh, one way you can say that is you want to, you need to somehow obscure the relationship between the plain text and the cipher text, right? Now, who gets to see the cipher text? Everybody. Okay, so Trudy certainly gets to see the cipher text. So if Trudy can determine the plain text from the cipher text, you're in trouble. So you have to somehow make that relationship hard to figure out. 
This one's maybe a little less obvious. Okay, diffusion. This is saying that you want to somehow take whatever statistics are available in the plain text and spread those around in the cipher text. Okay, now how does this relate to our classic ciphers, do you suppose? Well, okay, which of those classic ciphers we talked about uses diffusion, spreads the statistics around? The, what? <laughs> Come on, there's only four. I got to hear it eventually. <laughs> the simple substitution, the one-time pad, those kind of things, they're trying, some more successful than others, but they're really trying to obscure <laughs> that relationship between the plain text and ciphertext. They're not directly attacking the statistics themselves. <coughs> In other words, the statistics that tell you in the... If you look at, <laughs> if you look at like the simple substitution, right? Okay, how do you break that? You use the statistics, right, that are present in the plain text. Those sort of show through into the cipher text. Okay, so you can actually take advantage of the statistics themselves. <coughs> okay, so there's nothing done to really hide the underlying statistics. On the other hand, if you're looking at the double transposition, what does it do to those statistics, like pairs of letters and stuff like that that you would like to know about? That information is sort of spread out all over within these ciphertext. So I would say diffusion, there's double transposition. That's your classic example of that. Confusion, you could think a uh, simple substitution, you know, uh, one time pad, either of those you could consider uh, you know, confusion, that would be fine. One's good, one's not so good, but they're sort of using the same principle. <coughs> and he also proved the one time pad is secure. <coughs> and people had known about the one time pad for a long time, they'd used it for lots of things, but nobody had ever really they thought it was strong, but nobody had ever really rigorously shown that it was uh, secure. Okay, and you can think about you know how these things apply here to the various ciphers we looked at.